Praise the Lord. Am I all set, Bobby? All right. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I ask that you be with me tonight as I bring your word. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would have me to speak those things that you would have spoken. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Father, that you've given me here tonight. Father, once again, we pray for Pastor Bob as he's under the weather. Father, as Vicki prayed, we ask, Lord, for a speedy recovery, Father, in Jesus' name. Touch him, Lord, as, as he listens to this message tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Vicki was talking about um, choice. Everything's a choice. And um, we're going to see here tonight that we need to make choices. And we're going to be talking about two kings in uh, Second Chronicles, chapters 14 through 16. It's not an extensive Bible study. I um, wasn't aware that I was going to be sharing until 3 o'clock. Monday afternoon, so, and I readily said, when Bob asked me, I said, oh, okay, I'll do it, because I already had something that I was mulling over, but when I went to put it together, I couldn't put it together, so, <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, Lord, looks like you want to go in another direction, so, um, the Old Testament is full of do's and don'ts. And just like our life is now, you know, there's, you know, do I want to eat? Do I not want to eat? Do I want to go to the store? Do I not want to go to the store? Uh, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? And, you know, our life, as uh, Sister Vicki said, is full of choices. Well, we're going to uh, talk about two different kings tonight, King Uzziah and King Asa, mostly about King Asa and how these two kings, they, um, they brought spiritual ref reformation and revival to the southern kingdom of Judah. God's blessings were manifested, but later on, these two kings forsook the Lord and... Um, they suffered discipline from God because of it. Their fire in them had died out. So it doesn't matter how great you are and all the, how God uses you and all these great things. If you let that fire go out, it's all over. You know, Pastor says a lot of times, you know, um, talks about coals. And if you take that one coal and separate it, it's going to go out. So the central lesson of these two kings is do not forsake God. And that's what happened to these two kings. They, um, they forsook God. And whether they were aware of it at the time that they did it or not, that is what happened. So let's take a look at Second Chronicles uh, 15, verse 2. And it says here, And he went out to meet Asa. And said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, you can't get any plainer than that. If we seek him, he's going to be there for us. That's what he wants. He wants to be there for us. He's not going to force us. It's our choice. If we, it says right here, if we seek him, he'll be there for us. But then it says, if we forsake him, he will forsake us. Those are very painful words. Everything was going good as long as these two kings obeyed God's commands and trusted wholly in him and not in the arm of the flesh. You know, Things go e are going easy for us. God is using us, and we have the tendency to, you 
know, just start doing stuff in the natural. We're not even aware of it a lot of times. We just, you know, we start touch, uh, you know, doing things according to the flesh. That's why we have to continually seek God. If we want to see God move, we need to seek him and obey him. Not only do we need to seek him, but we need to obey those commandments that he's put forth to us. So 2 Chronicles 14.4 says, And commanded Judah, now this is Asa doing this, And commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. So he's instructing them to seek the Lord, not only, but to also to obey his commandments. We see James one twenty two. It talks about, um, I should have marked, I can, James one twenty two. here we go. But if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgotten what manner of man he was. So if you're not going to, you can listen to God's word, but if you don't act on it, it's not going to help you. If we want to, uh, we need to separate us, some of the things that we need to do. We need to separate ourselves from evil. Second Chronicles 14.5, and this is talking about Asa. Also, he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And then in 15.8, It says, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Odin, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from the Mount of Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. So he went and destroyed all these high mountains of Baal worship, worship that didn't belong to his people. It was a long time that his people had worshipped God, and he was instructing them and, you know, knocking down all those bad idols and and instructing the people that they need to... um, Restore the altar of the Lord. And also concerning Micaiah, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen. Can you imagine? This is his mother. He removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in the grove, and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burnt it at the brook Kidron. So you can imagine his mother, how furious she must have been. Can you imagine, you know, taking something that your, your mother worships and tearing it down and stamping on it and smashing it? He didn't care. That's how we have to be. We can't care. We have to stick up for what is right. Amen? Amen. We need to fortify our lives against spiritual danger. Second Chronicles 14, 6 through 8. And I had read a little bit of it, so I'll just um, read 6 and 7. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with an adversary. Be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. So whenever we do something for God, it doesn't go unnoticed. We will be rewarded for it. In Proverbs 24.10, it says, If you have slacked off in the day of trouble, your strength is small. 
We can't slack off. When something needs to be addressed, we need to address it. Another aspect is trusting in the Lord, not in methods. Second Chronicles 14.11. And, you know, when you have time, if you can read Second Chronicles 14, 15, and 16, it is awesome. I had my highlighter out, and then I had to put it down because I'm highlighting everything. And then I have my pen, and I'm like, oh, i got to use a different color pen. Cause, and then I said, I just threw everything down. I said, everything's good. I just love it. I, you know, and I, I got to put my, my tools down because before you know it, I won't be able to read it. So it's, it's really awesome, and you'll get a lot out of it. So Second Chronicles uh, 14, 11. Fourteen, eleven. Okay. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against the multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let no man prevail against us. So he was going up against the Ethiopian army. They had chariots. They had, like, all the latest things. And, you know, what did Judah have? Some swords, some spears, you know, not, not much stuff. But Asa knew that God, if he went to God, that even though they were weak, that God was going to deliver them from the Ethiopians, and that is exactly what happened. But while all this good stuff is going on, the title of my message tonight is Beware. We have to beware. The enemy will seduce us if we're not. We need to always be spending time with God. And um, that is his goal. When I was a, a young Christian, I found, when I found out that someone was no longer serving God, I would speak these words. How could they not be serving God any longer? I was like so confused. I know that person. They were used mighty of, in God's glory. How can they no longer be serving him? As a young believer, I had no comprehension of how this could happen. At that time in my life, I was still on my honeymoon with the Lord. He was still holding my hand every step of the way. I had no idea of the daily war that every believer is in in their time of life of serving God. It's a daily war. Whether we're sleeping, you get attacked at night, you know, it's 24-7 every single day. In Ephesians 6.12 is... Uh, our, an answer here, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I didn't realize that as a young Christian, because, you know, when you first get saved, God is just holding your hand, show, you know, just like a little baby, just showing you things and walking with you. And then eventually, as your faith builds and your trust builds, you know, he lets you go your own way. But back then, I, I just, I could not comprehend. Now, as a seasoned believer, I understand most of the tricks of the enemy of my soul. And I pray, Lord, have mercy. Let us be aware of any of the tactics of the enemy. All through scripture, I have read many stories of how great men have fallen away from God in their latter days. It's, it's all through the Old Testament. And, um, you know, what does it say in Galatians? It says in Galatians 3.1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. What that is saying is why this strange relapse, like what happened? They were not ignorant that Christ died for their sins. 
They knew it. But yet, they still were bewitched. Because if you don't spend quality time with God constantly, it's so easy to be bewitched. It's our nature to do bad things. And our flesh will draw us away. We have to be like Daniel. From the first day we set our hearts on God, we need to continue in the word of God and with a personal relationship of communication with him through prayer. I had read the book of Daniel on our vacation, and um, I hadn't read it in a long time, and it's it's, uh, a really great book about the end times and the Antichrist and but Daniel was a righteous man and you know and when he set his heart on serving God you see all through the book of Daniel that is exactly what he did and he proved God he didn't just keep it to himself and and stay in his uh, room and, and just pray no he gave ultimatums you give me Don't give me any meat and don't give me any uh, wine. Just give me, you know, these uh, vegetables. And he and his fellow men became even more stronger than the ones who had all the delicacies. He proved God. We can't be afraid not to prove God. We need to stop proving God. He's for us. There's nothing to fear. Amen. There's no other way. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this is telling us that we need to spend time in God's word because it's good for all these things, even for reproof for us. The word perfect in this scripture conveys the meaning of being brought where God wants us to be into his perfect will for each of our lives. It doesn't mean like we're going to be perfect and, uh, you know, we're not going to sin and we're not going to, you know, do anything wrong. But it's that word perfect means that we're going to be in the center of the will of God for our lives. And I want to be there. Time is coming to an end and we need to get going. Amen. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of kings, but there are many. So the two kings I'm going to talk about are Uzziah and King Asa, as I've kind of talked about him already. Uzziah began his reign over Judah at the age of 16 and ruled for 52 years, only to end up as a leper. I do not want to end up like that. So I'm going to continue seeking God and proving God and show people who he is. Amen? I mean, he became king at such a young age because his father passed away. In his early days, he walked in the ways of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And you can see that in 2 Chronicles 26, 5. See if I can get there. Second Chronicles twenty six five, and he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Amen. Uzziah was given a brilliant intellect and the ability ability to lead people into a period of peace and advancement for the kingdom of God. Amen? That's what we want. We want a time of uh, peace, a time where we can have the opportunity to lead people to Christ. Amen? But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his own destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord, his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And you can find that in Second Chronicles 26, 16. Can you imagine? He knew better. What was he thinking? 
Obviously, he wasn't thinking. He had become so puffed up. He knew that that was the place of the priest to do that, that it was never to be his place. It is almost unthinkable that Uzziah would do such a thing. I can't comprehend that. But he was in such a place where he walked away from God that, you know, just like Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. He was not obedient. He sacrificed. That was the place of the priest to do that. When things like this happen, I feel like a new believer for a minute. Again, asking those questions as I did then. I don't understand, God, how this could happen. But then in a minute, I do understand how it happens. And that is, is we become strong and trust in ourselves instead of trusting in God. It's something we constantly have to be aware of. I know myself, you know, because I'm good at certain things, and, I, and, you know, I have to catch myself, like, bring yourself back in because God could end it all. You know, like, it's just our nature. You know, God's given us abilities, and we need to be thankful for them and acknowledge him with those. There is a great danger in assuming that the Lord will not hold us accountable for what we do after walking in the blessings of God for many years. Even though we've walked in the blessings of God for many years, God will hold us accountable. We see here that he held Uzziah accountable. He held Asa accountable. Knowing nothing but his kindness and favor, we take him for granted. Suddenly, somehow, the things we run from in our youth as new believers somehow seem right in our eyes. You know, we become slack. Oh, well, that movie only had, like, one swear word in it, so, you know, no big deal, right? We would never do that as a young Christian. We would run from that. But somehow we become relaxed and slack. It is part of that fallen human nature that ultimately wants to be its own God. That's what, you see this in preachers. You know, that's what they teach. We are little gods. No, we're not little gods. We're creations of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But man has a tendency that they want to be in charge. They want to be little gods and determine what is good and what is evil even if it's completely contrary to the word of God. It's not our choice to determine what is good and what is evil unless we look in the word of God. If God's word says it's evil, we need to shun it. If God's word says it's okay, then it's okay. We have to step up and be more fervent in our walk. Perhaps this applies to you tonight. You have walked with God for years, experienced his blessing and favor, yet you are worshiping in church while doing something that you clearly know is a violation of the word of God. And I'm sure that there are a lot of churches that are full of people like that. They're out playing in a band on Saturday night, and then they're in church on Sunday morning, and I'm saying this through somebody I know, and then they're in church on Sunday morning as part of the worship team. What's that? You can't do that. You have to be pure. God is holy. However you mistakenly assume in your heart that you will not be held accountable, you will be held accountable. I will be held accountable. Everyone will be held accountable. When Azara and the other priests went in after Uzziah to withstand him because he was making an offering to the Lord, which was not his place, Uzziah became angry and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, the leprosy even rose up to his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord. This is in Second Chronicles 26, 19 through 21. I'm not going to take time to turn there, but
but you can read it on your own. The priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azara, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself also hastened to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper till the day of his death. And that's in 2 Chronicles 26, 19 through 21. So it doesn't matter that God used him mightily for all those years. It doesn't matter that he brought revival to Judah. It doesn't matter that uh, he reformed the religion there and, and, and all that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter all those great things he did because he never finished the race. Paul talks about finishing the race. We need to finish the race. Imagine 52 years of history wiped out by one foolish act. There should have been a glorious ending to Uzziah's life, but instead he ended up in a leper colony, literally put away by the hand of God. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. The leprosy on his forehead was a type of the disease that had taken hold of his mind. Yeah, he lost his mind by doing that. It's like, what is wrong with you? Does this remind you of the church today? Sometimes when I'm watching preaching on TV, which is not often, I just, you know, be going through channels and I might stop on something. And, and then I become like a crazy person because I'm yelling at the TV. I say as the preacher is speaking, have you lost your mind? That's not true. How could you say that? Like he can hear me. But it's just so frustrating. It's like... Are you not reading the same book that I'm reading? That is so untrue. How could you say that? And, he's, and they're leading how many people down the wrong path? When you have walked for a long time in the blessings of the Lord, beware, 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 for you could lose your life. Stay steadfast in the fellowship with God and the reading of his word and the fellowship of the saints. That's another criteria. We need to stay together. If we seek the Lord, he will, as Scripture said, if we seek the Lord, he will strongly support us. But if we forsake him, we come under his discipline. Lord, have mercy. Now I'm going to talk a, a little more about Asa now. That was Uzziah. Asa was another king of Judah who had a promising beginning. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of his God. For he took away the altars of strange gods and the high places and, break down, and broke down the images and cut down the groves. And that's in 2 Chronicles 14, verses 2 and 3. Asa started out with a desire to do God's things God's way. He wanted to do things God's way. And... That's where I believe everybody starts. You know, when you come to know the Lord, you want to do things God's way. He wholeheartedly served the Lord and led others into obedience. And, and the people built and prospered under his leadership. And that's what we want. When we lead someone to the Lord, we want to help them to, to grow and to prosper in God's word. Amen? When the, Ethiopian, uh, when the Ethiopian army came against the people of Judah with almost two to one odds, you know, it was like 3,000 to 1,000, Asa went straight to prayer. This is what Asa said, and we already read this. Lord, it does not really matter how many of them there are or how weak we are. He was just telling it like it is. God, we're weak. We don't have everything, all those modern things that they have. If you are in this, which he was, and we know that because the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian army was defeated, we are going to win the battle, and we are going to fight it for your glory. See, he wasn't fighting it for his glory, for Asa to say, oh, my kingdom beat the Ethiopians. No, he wasn't saying that. He said to God, for your glory. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians. Amen. We, like Asa, have walked in impossible places. 
we have faced trials at times in our life when we knew we were powerless to get out of that captiveness that we were in. And, you know, sometimes, like, you run into situations and you just cry out to God. It's like, God, there isn't anything I can do. And you call out to him. And he will answer you if you have been diligently seeking him. He wants to help you, but if you're just going to call out to him in your time of need, you know, you forsook him for five years, and then um, all of a sudden something terrible is happening, and you want him to help you. Well, what do you think is going to happen? We read, we read that in Scripture. If you forsake me, I will forsake you. Yet we went into our prayer closet and cried, Lord, I know I am weak, but it doesn't matter because the power of your Holy Spirit is on me. For the glory of your name, take me out of this place and into where you want me to go. And God did exactly that, opening the impossible door. Later during the 36th year of Asa's reign, the northern kingdom of Israel came and built a fortified city against one of the areas of Judah. So the northern king, there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Well, the northern kingdom was coming against the southern ki kingdom, and they were building a fortified area. Despite witnessing the faithfulness of God over and over again, Suddenly, we see Asa take a turn. So sad, and how many times do we see that in our life? And you try to figure out, where did these people go wrong? Well, we know the answer. Because they started getting puffed up, they started trusting in their own abilities, and because of all the blessings of God, they just took him for granted. He did go into the house of the Lord, but this time he did not go there to pray that God would once again glorify his name in the impossible situation. So he went into the house of the Lord, but he went there for another reason, not to ask God to help him. Rather, Asa went into the house of the Lord to take out the treasures so he could hire a foreign army to help fight against the enemy. I mean, why would he do that? Time after time, he saw God's hand. Why would he do that? So this foreign king, accepting Asa's offer of silver and gold, the Syrian king sent the captains of his army to come to Judah's aid, causing the northern kingdom to, to retreat. Okay, so they retreated. That's a good thing, maybe. Then Asa... The king took all Judah, and they carried away the, the stones and the timber and the buildings and, like, all, all the spoils. They, they, they took everything, and that's in Second Chronicles 16.6. 6. It all certainly looked successful. A lot of things look successful, but really, how does God look at it? They won again, outsmarted the enemy. Asa may have even given some credit to God for this. Who knows? The people of Judah took down the fortified city that was being built against them and used the stones to build additional places of habitation for the people of God in Judah. What possible problem could God have with this? Yeah, it's all, it's all good. Like we got all, all this wood and all these you know rocks and we're just going to... Build places for God's people. What's wrong with that? See, we, we say in our heads, you know, I'm doing a good thing. But that's not how God looks at it. He wants us to seek him. So if it looks successful on the outward, we always need to ask God, what I, how do you feel about this? They cut down their own strength by, well, basically Asa cut down his own strength by doing that. 
And at that time, Hanai the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, which is now our enemy also, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. That's what happened. He took things in his own hands, and instead of having peace like God had given them, no. Now they were continually going to have wars, and that's in 2 Chronicles 16, 7, and 9. It all had the appearance of success, but the prophet of God said, no, it is not success, it is foolishness. What you did was foolish. You began in the spirit with a wholehearted trust in God, but you have turned to the flesh, scheming and reasoning how to get through. And that is human nature. You have literally, literally, literally cut off the source of your own strength, and now the end result is that you are going to have trouble the rest of your life. Just like King David, he was a man of war. He had trouble for the rest of his life. He could not build the temple that had to go to his son, Solomon. After so many years of walking with the Lord, Asa should have been open to correction. That's another thing. When God corrects us, we need to be open to that. He doesn't correct us because he's mean. He corrects us because he loves us. One would think that he would have fallen on his knees before the Lord in repentance. You would think because he knew him so well. But we read in verse 10, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in prison. Oh my gosh. Here is the man of God telling Asa, God has given him Asa a chance. He's given Asa a chance to repent. So what does he do? He, he does like Carolyn's kids when they put their hands on their ears. Then uh, puppies and kitties, puppies and kitties. Well, I'm just going to put him in prison. That way I don't have to hear him. In other words, he locked away the voice of correction and now held the key to what could and could not be spoken. He put away the voice of God. He did not repent when he had the opportunity. We don't always have that opportunity. Sometime God's just going to leave us. That is exactly what the enemy of our souls wants us to do. Rely on ourselves. Don't listen to the voice of God. The devil says, you can choose for yourself. Vicki always like preaches my mes message in her worship. <laughs> the devil says, you can choose for yourself. What is truth? You can choose for yourself who to bend your knee to. No one has the right to tell you what you're going to do and what not to do. After all, you have been walking with the Lord for many years, so pride has been built up. How dangerous it is when we become angry with spiritual authority. Asa should have listened to Hanai, but instead he was filled with rage. He could not escape the thought that he was rebuked, which is often the dilemma of those who have long walked with God. Lord, have mercy. I pray that that is never going to happen to any of us, that we will always have that sensitive spot to listen to the correction of the Lord. Asa was dead inside. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet. Until his disease was exceedingly great, yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but sought physicians. So he still, he's still trusting in the arm of the flesh and not trusting in the God that he served all those years. And you can read that in Second Chronicles sixteen twelve. And back to Uzziah for a minute. Uzziah was diseased in his forehead because his mind had turned against the ways of God. 
And here we see Asa diseased in his feet because he was pursuing a direction contrary to the desire of God. We always need to be in tune to the direction of the desire of God that he wants us to go in. I mean, there are many things that we can do on our own. You know, we have abilities and, you know, we can say, oh, I, I want to do this, but what does God say? Like, when Pastor asked me to um, do this message tonight, I was all set. I, I immediately said yes, because I already had something going, and I could not put it together because God wanted to say something else. However, God, however, God's incredible mercy is still evident. As the psalmist said, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. Now there's a heart after God, Psalm 119.75. When we're afflicted, we need to examine ourselves and we need to say, yes, Lord, I see the error of my way. Or even if we don't see the error of our way, we still should go the way that God is asking us to go because he sees far beyond what we can see. Amen? God faithfully allowed this ail ailment in order to prompt Asa to turn back to him, but he didn't. If someone has come into your life that you do not understand, if something has come into your life that you do not understand, I encourage you to stop for a moment. Consider that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And everybody knows that scripture. It's in Romans 8, 28. But the key here is everything works together for good for those who love God. A lot of people don't know what it means to love God. They don't even know the, what the word means in the natural. And they have a warped vision, a warped understanding. Could it be that God has allowed a circumstance in our life in order to stop us from making a foolish decision? Yeah, you know what? I thank God for all the prayers that he has not answered that I prayed. I am telling you, sometimes when I think about it, I'm like, but at the time I'm praying them, I mean, I'm like really calling out to God. I really need this prayer answered. I, you know, I, I'm having this issue, and please, God, please answer me. And then he doesn't answer me, and then I, I kind of like something happens, or, you know, and I just kind of forget about it. And then a while down the road, I'm just like, he brings it back to my remembrance. I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you did not answer that prayer. You know? <laughs> if only Asa had turned to God and asked, Lord, why are, you, why are my feet diseased? You know, that's a good question. When something happens to us, God, why is this happening to me? Please show me. Is there something in my life that I... I've, you know, messed up on. Am I going against your will? Am I going in the wrong direction? Because a lot of times we don't know. I'm sure the Lord would have sent a prophet to him if he could not discern the answer for himself. He would have heard, you are walking in the wrong path. You are walking in the flesh. You started in the spirit, but now you are walking in your own strength. God, that's all God wanted him to do. He wanted Asa to ask him, God, why am I sick? Why is this happening to me? Can you please help me? And God would have been right there to help him. But then Asa slept with his fathers and died. And in one and fortieth year of his reign, and they buried him in his own sepulcher, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and he laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and diverse ki kinds of spices prepared by the people of the day that like kind of like chemists or perfume makers, you know. Well, perfume makers are chemists, right? And um, 
And they made a very great burning of him, and that's in Second Chronicles 16, 13 through 14. Here we see a picture of what happens when you lose dependence on the Holy Spirit. You look good, you smell sweet, but in reality, you are very, very dead. There are a lot of people in church today that are very, very dead. They know all the key phrases, they know all the songs, and um, when I was back in Bible school, there was this woman there, and I was still a young Christian, and I was speaking with her, and she was, well, maybe I shouldn't go there with this story. Well, <laughs> Anyway, she was having problems, and um, we'll just leave it at that. Anyway, the Lord said to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, Thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. That's in Revelation 3.1. The word dead means cut off from the living influence of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. You're just cut off. Look what happened um, to Samson. And he wasn't even aware of it. You know, he lost all his strength. Didn't even know that he's, his strength was gone. You are now walking in the flesh. You have learned how to, that's what I was talking about before, we have learned how to sing songs, clap our hands, but we've been cut off, not we, but, you know, people who walk away from God have been cut off for the, from the quickening of the, Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, and that's how Asa ended up. We need to renew the altar of the Lord, and that is also in uh, Second Chronicles 14 through 16. I had already read it. I believe at a significant point during Asa's reign, he could have avoided the disease in his feet just by staying on the right path. That, that is so true. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Odid. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you. He was telling him, the Lord was with him, while you be with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, you would think that that would jar his memory, that he had known that, that if he sought God and, and God would, you know, honor him and help him. But it's like it, it just didn't mean anything to him. You know, when I was a, a very young Christian, this is the only time that God has ever spoken to me audibly. I sat up in my bed he gave me a scripture, and all through my Christian life, when I've been weak, I always quote that scripture because that is what has kept me. Of course, you know, the Holy Spirit has kept me, but like, because it was so powerful, it was spoken to me, and Every time, like, I'm wavering or whatever's happening, I think of that scripture, and that pulls me right back in because it was, even though I was not doing anything wrong, it was God warning me. If you do this, this is going to happen to you. And God always pulled me back in with those words. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God, but when they, when they were in trouble, they trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him. He was found of them. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Odid, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities where he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord, Second Chronicles 15, 1 through 8. If you don't want to finish your race like Asa and Uzziah, 
we need to renew the altar of the Lord. Amen? The Bible describes the altar as the place where we lay our lives down as a living sacrifice for the purposes of God. Amen? That's what we want. We want to lay our lives down. It is where we agree that we should not live according to our thoughts, our ways, or our will, but the thoughts, the will, and the will of the Lord. Amen? That's how we should be living our life. And it's not a hard thing. If you read Romans 12.1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He didn't make it hard for us. It says right in the word, it's our reasonable service. Amen? So we need to be putting our lives on the altar for God to use us as he wills. It is a time to renew the altar of the Lord. It is time to get back to that place where we once shunned all evil and embraced the altar of the Lord. Sorry about that, my battery died. It is a time to renew the altar of the Lord. It is time to get back to that place where we once shunned evil and embraced the altar of the Lord. We need to get back where our heart burned when we read the word of God because we knew it was alive. And I know a lot of you here have heard my testimony when I got saved. I, I had gone to a Bible study because I had... Um, company and they had gotten saved and I didn't know it and they said oh can you take me to a bible study and I was not happy but I did but that night I ended up getting saved and when I went home I took my mother's bible and I opened it and God's words were jumping off the pages they were breathing they were alive they had life and I kept saying to my mother ma do you see this? Ma, do you see that? Well, of course, she couldn't see it because it was for me. But God's word is alive. Amen. And we need to get back to that. Remember when your eyes were filled with tears at the mention of Jesus' name. I mean, my sister-in-law, because they got saved before I did, every time I'd leave the house, she'd say these words to me. She'd be hanging out the door. Jesus loves you. I cannot tell you what that did to me. For years and years, if someone said those words to me, I'd start crying. Because even though I was saved, those words were so penetrating that they still affected my life. Remember when you considered that being a servant was the highest calling? Remember way back when? You know, mopping up the church, taking a broom. That was it. Didn't care about anything else. What can I do? What can I do? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll mop the church or I'll polish. You know, what do you need me to do? We just wanted to serve. We need to get back where our heart's cry was. Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to be at work in your kingdom. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how big. And as I said, it can be a broom as long as it's glorifying God. Notice also that before he renewed the altar of the Lord, Asa took courage and put away all the idols in the land. And I already spoke on that. How can you imagine, you know, tearing down his mother's idols? She must have been furious. But he didn't care because he was standing for God. Today, if you have doubtful practices in your life, put them away. Like if there's anything that you're just, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, you know, put it away. If you embrace sin erroneously, believing that there will be no judgment for it, 
you need to flee from it as quickly as you can because judgment day is coming and it's coming soon. We don't know when, but it's soon. Walk in what is right and do not ever lose the fear of God. God is wonderful, loving, and loving and just and kind, but he is also holy and just. He is the judge. He will not be mocked. We cannot play games with the whole with God. He's holy. We must have honesty of heart. Perhaps we put away all the known idols in our life, yet we still find ourselves with no passion for the things of God. And that happens to people. The only thing that you can do is just throw yourself on the mercy of God to bring you back to that place where you first believed. Because something has happened. And his word, his word in the beginning was life to your bones. And that's where you need to be. God's word needs to be life to your bones. If you come to the Lord with an honest cry, he will answer you. Just like that cry of salvation. He will answer you. He will not only bring life back to you, but he will help you finish the race. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.